Consider the rules of a game. Its rules allow for a virtually infinite number of strategies and outcomes, maintaining players' interest for centuries. Similarly, the laws of physics can be seen as the rules of a cosmic game. These laws have the extraordinary capability to produce complex structures from galaxies to life itself. This demands an explanation. Why do the rules of our universe allow for such complexity? Like the evolving rules of chess, it seems our universe's laws are finely tuned to generate and sustain intricate patterns. This capacity for complexity extends beyond mere survival. So, why does our universe possess such finely tuned rules? If cosmological fine-tuning is amenable to an evolutionary explanation, then it seems as if life would itself somehow need to be involved in the reproduction of universes in some way. It is hard to imagine how this might work. Not only do we lack a mechanism to allow universes to reproduce, but we also do not have a plausible selection process which would guide universes towards the observed fine-tuning. This does not necessarily mean that our universe has not evolved to support life. We might simply be in the position of the castaway, unable to imagine, let alone study, the actual processes responsible. After all, there is no reason to assume that cosmological processes so far beyond human scales of time and space are tractable to human inquiry. Yet the fable of the castaway suggests a tantalizing possibility. Remember that an evolutionary explanation for the castaway's existence makes different predictions from the infinite islands hypothesis. The anthropic principle is the same. It explains the observer, but nothing more. We cannot expect further fine-tuning to be discovered beyond that required to explain the emergence of organisms capable of observation. For this reason, this account of life is highly pessimistic. If life-friendly universes are like 747 jets assembled by junkyard tornadoes, their flight characteristics cannot be expected to be dazzling. The vast majority of such planes will collapse at the first push. If, however, life-friendly universes are part of a vast process of cosmic evolution, then we should expect life in the universe to be robust in the way that evolved organisms are. If the DNA of our universe, the laws of physics, evolved, then the problems that the human race faces as a species might be part of an evolved growth process. All intelligent life in the universe is probably carbon-based, at least initially. This implies that all intelligent species that evolve within it will have large fossil fuel reserves available to them from the deposited bodies of previous organisms. Many will likely exploit these reserves to fuel their technological rise, ultimately giving rise to a climate crisis much like our own. This might, if the anthropic explanation is correct, be how intelligent species die out. However, if universes evolve, this could also itself be part of a predictable pattern that evolving life forms go through. These might be evolutionary challenges built into the evolved design of life in the universe, in the same way that puberty is an evolved stage in an individual human life's trajectory. It might be how our next evolutionary stage is catalyzed. These might be considered wild speculations, yet really they are barely wilder than the anthropic principle. If all possible physics, even all possible realities exist, then the idea that the universe might have evolved as part of some larger process does not seem all that far-fetched. An example of the application of the anthropic principle is the explanation for why the Earth exists in a perfect location for life, neither too far from a star nor too close. This region is often referred to as the Goldilocks zone where conditions are neither too hot nor too cold, but just right for life. But what can explain this lucky coincidence? Clearly the answer is that life could only evolve in such Goldilocks zones, where the conditions are suitable for sustaining it. This lucky coincidence is actually an example of a kind of selection bias, since the universe can by definition only be observed from locations where observers can arise in the first place. This explanation for fine-tuning can make a lot of physicists squirm. It only works if the universe is actually a multiverse with regions where the laws of physics are different. In fact, it would suggest that there must be a huge number of different physics out there somewhere. Maybe even every possible physics, a mind-numbing thought which runs counter to most scientists' deeply held convictions about the nature of the physical world and physics itself. Since Newton, and before, we thought we were uncovering laws that apply to the whole of everything for all time, not merely taking notes about our local surroundings, as it were. 
Consider this thought experiment. A scientist is stuck in a room somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere with no knowledge of the outside world or its laws and just a kitchen sink. When she pours water down the sink, she notes the water forms a vortex rotating in a counterclockwise motion. She thinks, first law of plug holes, water always drains in a counterclockwise fashion. The problem is that the physicist, confined to just one location, cannot make enough observations to contradict her theory and thus form a better law or understand the deeper principle. If she could escape her room and travel to the southern hemisphere, she would discover that vortices in water rotate in the opposite direction. What she thought was a universal law was in fact merely a local regularity. She thought she was studying law when really she was studying geography. This thought experiment reveals how, without access to a sufficiently broad sample of observations, we will be tempted to mistake local regularities for universal laws or brute facts. The fine-tuning problem is the observation that many of the fundamental constants of physics appear to have been finely calibrated to values that allow for the existence of life. Vary any of them by much and things quickly get ugly. Stars don't form properly or burn up too quickly, atoms can't combine into complex molecules or don't form stable nuclei, and so on. For example, if neutrons were not slightly heavier than protons, they would not decay outside of nuclei and some essential elements would not exist. If the cosmological constant were much larger, the universe would have expanded too rapidly for stars and galaxies to form. It seems that uh, to get a universe in which complex structures are even possible requires one to set the basic parameters of physics within very tight bounds. We tend to take the basic attributes of the physical world for granted, yet when considered more closely, the fact that the world works for life is both strange and remarkable. Carbon has an incredibly complex chemistry which allows it to form long chains and bond with hydrogen, oxygen and other elements to form a vast array of molecules and compounds that are not only essential for life but also allow for many of the synthetic materials like plastics, drugs and industrial chemicals which make modernity possible. Only one such element exists. If it didn't, life could not have evolved. Hydrogen and oxygen happen to combine to form water a substance without which life would also not be possible. These properties include its capacity to dissolve a wide range of substances, making it an ideal medium for the transport of nutrients in organisms. Its high specific heat capacity, which allows it to stabilize temperatures within organisms and environments, and its high heat of vaporization, rendering it capable of acting as a coolant for organisms through sweating and transpiration. It is remarkable indeed that a molecule with such perfectly life-friendly properties is not only permitted by the periodic table, but created in such natural abundance as to form oceans on planets located in temperate orbits. It is another apparently lucky fluke that the specific nuclear pathways by which different atomic nuclei are synthesized within stars mean that different elements are created in just the right quantities to allow rocky planets, largely made of silicon-based rocks, the other element which can form long chains in combination with other elements with life-friendly atmospheres to form. If, instead of silicate-based rocks, planets were formed out of metals, for example, the mineral-rich soils which permit plant life to flourish on land would not exist. Volcanism, which plays an essential role in recycling atmospheric gases and maintaining an atmosphere suitable for life, would also not occur and the high heat conductivity of metal would result in huge temperature differentials incompatible with life as we know it. When we look at the wider universe, it is easy to see the vast icy voids, the titanic energies of stars and supernovae, the terrifying black holes and random world-destroying collisions, and conclude that we live in a world that is utterly indifferent to life, if not actively hostile to it. Yet the periodic table gives the lie to this impression. If anything, it looks like the laws of physics are a finely engineered solution to the problem of how to form complex worlds which conscious organisms can inhabit. In fact, I would argue that fine-tuning runs deeper than is often acknowledged. Most formulations of the fine-tuning problem have tended to focus on the values of constants because these hard-coded values in the equations of physics naturally beg the question of why they have these specific values and not others. Yet we might also legitimately ask why the laws of quantum mechanics are as they are, why space has three dimensions and time one, or why there are 12 particles in the standard model 
and not five or fifty if we accept the premise that nothing should be taken as a brute fact that is in principle beyond explanation then we can take the matter even further and ask why it is that we see a physical universe consisting of matter energy space and time if we consider energy to be the measure of change within physical systems and matter to represent stability within those same systems, then we can see that a balance between these two principles is necessary in order for life and consciousness to exist. There can be no evolution without this balance and no conscious self with memory and coherent experience. Time is required to mediate this balance of stability and change. Space is required in order to provide the dimensionality within which separate observing structures exist. The basic features of a physical universe are preconditions for the existence of living organisms. To the extent that the fine-tuning problem is engaged with by physicists, until recently it was almost completely ignored because it was uncomfortably challenging to long-held philosophical assumptions. The most commonly accepted explanation is the so-called anthropic principle. This principle states that the conditions observed in the universe must perforce be ones that permit the observer to exist in the first place. Physicist Leonard Susskind has said in an interview that if a gun were put to their head, note the implied reluctance, most physicists would probably bet on the anthropic principle as the likely explanation for fine-tuning. When it comes to fine-tuned structures like the periodic table or DNA, we typically resort to two types of explanations, random or evolutionary. Here we are focusing solely on naturalistic explanations, setting aside the notion of design. Given a sufficiently large context of random variation, complex substructures can emerge, and selection bias may then account for the illusion that something highly improbable has occurred. When a vast field of random variation is directly observable, the random explanation might suffice. However, when it is not, the choice between random and evolutionary explanations becomes more ambiguous, though not necessarily beyond empirical investigation. Consider the hypothetical scenario of a castaway philosopher. If this individual discovered the theory of evolution, they might be able to make significant predictions. For instance, they might hypothesize that their body would have naturally evolved mechanisms for self-healing minor injuries, thus expecting to recover from such wounds. The infinite island's explanation, on the other hand, would not predict this. In fact, self-healing would be considered an anomaly in that context. Infinite islands explain the observer, but nothing more. If more fine-tuning is observed beyond what is strictly required to make the initial observation of such as self-healing, then the infinite island's explanation begins to falter. One physicist who has attempted to provide an evolutionary account of fine-tuning is Lee Smolin. Smolin's idea is both intriguing and controversial. He proposes that black holes give birth to new universes, each with slightly varied physical laws, much like genetic mutations in DNA that give rise to new organisms. According to Smolin, universes that produce more black holes pass on their DNA, their physical laws, to offspring universes leading over generations to physics increasingly fine-tuned for black hole production. Interestingly, the laws required for black hole production are also highly conducive to life, suggesting that the cosmos may evolve towards life-bearing universes. In conclusion, the anthropic principle offers a fascinating lens through which we can view the universe. It suggests that the very fabric of our cosmos is finely tuned to support life raising profound questions about the nature of existence and our place within it.